Well, good morning. Listen, for those of you that are still a little like, is communion going to be back where it's supposed to be next week? Okay, here's what I promise you. We value communion here, and we will always celebrate, and we will participate in communion together. So thank you for a little bit of flexibility there today. Thanks for just going, hey, we want to experience Jesus fresh and new every week. Yeah, give yourself a hand. Um, several years ago, Denise and I took that big step in adulting. Now, we had been married several years, we had kids, but I think the biggest step you can take in adulting is hosting Thanksgiving at your own home for the whole family. And so we got up the courage, we got up the nerve, and we decided we are going to adult and we are inviting everybody over. So we did. Now, before then, you know how it works. The kids come over and they bring a side, they bring bread, they bring something easy. And mom or grandma usually takes care of the big spread of turkey and, and all those kind of things. And so on this particular Sunday, or this particular Thanksgiving, we're like, we're taking care of all of it. Just y'all show up and we've got it. And so we planned all week long for everything. And the one thing I realized is we need bread, but I wanted to like kind of show off a little bit. And so I said, Denise, let's make homemade bread for Thanksgiving this year. And so we bought all the ingredients. That morning comes, we're getting everything together and I'm looking at the recipe. I said, I'll take care of the bread. And I realized we forgot to buy that little packet of yeast. Now, I had never made bread before, so I thought, it only calls for like a teaspoon or a tablespoon. It can't be that big a deal. Maybe throw some extra flour in there or something. It all kind of looks the same. It should turn out just fine. And so on this particular Thanksgiving, the year that we adulted and we invited everyone over and I made the bread, can you imagine what the bread was like? It was just flat. There was no fluff to it. They didn't rise. And I learned really quickly, without a little bit of yeast, my bread will always be flat. Now, I share that story because here's the deal. I think the same thing works in our life with joy. It only takes a little bit of joy in our life to kind of give us that vibrant, that vibrant, that, just that excitement. But when we don't have that little bit of joy in our life, do you ever just feel like life is flat? I mean, like the alarm clock goes off and you can't even get out of bed because you're going, there's just no joy there. And so what we did, if you're new at this this week, beginning of summer, we began a brand new series called Whatever. And we're looking at joy in our lives. And the way we're doing it, we're looking at the book of Philippians, which is really just a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. And this whole letter, he is writing to the church of Philippi. And he's trying to explain to them. He's trying to teach them. He's trying to model for them how to have joy in their life in all areas of their life. And so, so far, we've looked at finding joy in our life in relationships. We've looked at finding joy in our life in circumstances. So here's what we're doing today. We're looking at finding joy in our life in our attitude. Okay. I didn't start out that way because I thought nobody would come back to church if it started out that way. How many of you could say you could use a little bit of joy in your attitude? Okay, so this sermon's for you. I'm so glad you came here today. In fact, you may be sitting there going, I'm not really sure that this sermon's for me. I mean, I have a pretty good attitude, so I think for the most part, people are lucky to be around me. Let's just do kind of an attitude check here for a second. Here's your own self-quiz that you can determine if this sermon is for you. If um, you can be a little stubborn in your position, this sermon on attitude is for you. If others say you have a glass half full disposition, but you always respond, it's because those people around you keep tipping your glass over, this sermon over attitude is for you. If if you find yourself sometimes being reactive and short-tempered because things don't go your way, this sermon's for you. If your relationships aren't working, but you know they'd be better if the people around you would get their act together, this sermon about attitude is for you. If you're complaining, uh, or, or if complaining is one of your favorite pastimes, guess what? This sermon's for you. If you can't deal with uh, others' opinions or unwanted truth, or the older you get, the more you realize you need adult supervision, this sermon about attitude is just for you. Now, you still may be going, I'm not sure yet. Here, here's the best way to, to figure out if this sermon's for you. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, do I need this sermon? Okay? If they look at you and smile and say, thank you, Jesus, for you coming, this sermon is for you. Now, so we can all confess, we all agree, we probably need a little bit of attitude adjustment. So the best place to go to to get our attitude adjusted, just like anything else, is the Bible. And so we're going to be picking up our study of Philippians in Philippians chapter 2, and verse 1 through, 1 through 4. And here's what it says there. If you have any encouragement from being with, united with Christ, if any comfort in His love, 
if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, he goes on to say, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And then he says, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each other to the, or, but each of you to the interest of the others. Several years ago, when Denise and I were early in our marriage, we looked up and all of a sudden we were in credit card debt. Probably no one else has ever been there before, but we had a lot of nice things around us and we were still paying for them every single month when that bill came. And so finally we went to a friend of ours, her name, was, name is Thelma, and we said, Thelma, we need help. Okay, we're not very smart in this. We've not been very wise. Can you help us? And so I'll never forget the night she came over to our house and we laid out all of our financial, financials before our friend Thelma. And we said, could you help us? And I'll never forget the words that came out of her mouth, two words that have stuck with me forever. She looked at all of our financials. She looked at all how much we owed on credit cards. She looked how much money we were bringing in. And her two words said, good gosh. That was the two words. At that moment, I knew that we were probably in a little bit of trouble with our finances, but she began the task of just coming alongside us, helping us budget, helping us to do things. But I'll never forget the next set of words that she gave us. And this was her phrase, what you gonna give up? Because we wanted vacations, we wanted more furniture, we wanted more, more fun adventures for our kids. And so all these things that we wanted to spend on, but she saw what was coming in and what was already committed. And so her phrase that she told us all the time is, what you going to give up? In fact, our kids were elementary age at that point. And every once in a while we'd say, hey, do y'all want to go out to eat tonight? And my kids, that was so ingrained in them, they'd look at us going, what are we going to give up? Because they knew that sometimes you have to give up something to get some. We had to make some adjustments in our life. And what Paul is writing here is he talks about our attitude, about having joy in our attitude. He's basically saying, you're going to have some, to make some adjustments in your life if you're going to find joy in your attitude. Most of us default and say the people around me need to make some adjustments in their life if I'm ever going to find joy. But Paul, when he was writing this, was not talking about everybody else. He's going to us individually. If you want joy in your life, there are some adjustments that you have to make. And as we look at these first few verses in this the second chapter, he's, what he's saying is this one. There's some things that you're going to have to give up in your life if you want to find joy. And there's some things that you're going to have to add to your life if you want to find this joy. And so let's look at that verse just a little bit deeper, and we're going to pull out and find these things that we need to add and these things that we need to detract from our life. Verse two, verse, or chapter 2, verse 3, he says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So right there in that verse, Paul gives us two things that we're going to have to give up in our lives if we want to find joy. And the first one is this, and if you're taking notes, you can fill in the blanks there, and it says this, We're going to have to give up what's in it for me attitude. What's in it for me, attitude or mindset? The word, the phrase that he uses, two words together there in the verse was selfish ambition. Let's all agree, it is not a bad thing to have ambition. Ambition is that very thing that drives, that, that drives our desire to move us forward. If we didn't have ambition in life, we would never have a nicer house or a nicer car. If we didn't have ambition in life, we may never go to college. So there's lots of things in life that it's good to have ambition about. It is the very thing that drives us, that gives us that desire to move forward. But selfish ambition, Paul says, can be very negative because with selfish ambition versus just regular ambition, Ambition, we're willing that desire to move forward. And selfish ambition, we're willing to step on people to get further where we want to get. Selfish, and and selfish ambition is all about me, me, me. It doesn't consider those around us. And so Paul was writing to the Philippians going, if you ever want to find your joy again, if you want to not just feel like you're flat all the time in life, if you want to have the energy to get out of bed, you're going to have, stop, to have to stop thinking about yourself and you're going to have to put others in the picture. You're going to, stop have to ha or you're going to have to stop having selfish ambition. You're going to have to stop always running things through your own filter. And then he gives a second thing with there. He says this, not only is it what's in it for me mindset you got to get rid of, you also have to get rid of the mindset, how am I being noticed? How am I being noticed? The, the word he used there was instead of vain ambition, he used vain conceit. Like, I don't want just things for me. I, I want everybody to see me. 
Now, here's the confessional thing here. I wrote this sermon earlier this week, and, and I was thinking of a good illustration, and I just stepped into my own illustration yesterday. Denise and I went out um, to the mall, and we were hungry, so we stopped by just a local hamburger joint there. And I almost hate to acknowledge this restaurant out loud, because you'll know that I, t I went there, and it's not one of my bragging rights, but we went to In-N-Out yesterday. Now, here's what I know about In-N-Out. I grew up in Texas, and I lived in California for five years. In-N-Out and Whataburger are fighting words for two people. And I thought to myself, you know what? I think I'm going to post on social media. In fact, I think I've got a picture of what I posted on social media there. And I simply just said, sometimes you have to stop, stoop really low when there's nothing else to eat. Now, let me, let me just, here's my confession. Here's why I put that post on there. It wasn't because I was trying to advertise for In-N-Out or I wasn't even trying to talk bad about In-N-Out. I was at this moment that I'm like, I want people to pay attention to me on social media. And I knew the moment I posted that, all the friends in Texas would start talking about how bad In-N-Out is, and all my friends in California would talk about how good In-N-Out is, and I would get all these likes and all these comments, and I'd feel really, really special. Because they'd all be looking at my post, acknowledging me what I wrote, regardless of how silly it was I wrote about, they would notice me. Now, don't leave me hanging here by myself. Don't we all live that way sometimes? Nobody wants to walk in a room and be unnoticed. They said this, the loneliest place in the world is in a crowded room all by yourself. We all want to be noticed. I guarantee when you walked into church this morning, if somebody reached out their hand to shake your hand and say good morning or give you a big hug, you just thought, wow, I'm somebody. I'm known here. It's a natural thing about us. But when we take the attitude that when I walk in the room, everyone needs to stop what they're doing to notice me. When I step onto social media and everybody needs to pay attention to me, when I walk into my house and everybody needs to kind of bow down, the king or queen is here, that's what Paul is saying, that is nothing more than vain conceit. And he's going, the reason we don't have our joy is because we're so full of selfish ambition and vain conceit. In other words, we're just walking around going, life needs to evolve and I need to be the center of what life is doing right now. And he's writing to the Philippians, but he's writing to us today going, if you want to rediscover your joy, if you want to have this joy that you once had, if you don't want to wake up feel like you just want to go back to bed before you ever get out of bed, that you're going to have to stop being so me-centered. I think the best exercise that we could do in the morning, you wake up and you look in the mirror. Do you know why we look in the mirror? So we can see what we need to change so people will take notice of us during the day. We ought to just take an erasable marker and put a big black X right where our face is. Now, I hope we brush our teeth when you look in the mirror. I hope you comb your hair. We want us to look presentable, <laughs> but our presentable disposition is so the world begins to evolve around me. And I wonder, by Paul's advice here, he didn't give the specific advice, but I wonder if we just put that X over our mirror every day when we looked in the mirror, we'd be remind ourselves, life is not about me. Think back to chapter one when Paul was writing. He was going, there were some people out there, they were preaching the gospel with the wrong motive. And what did he say to that? He's going, who cares? Okay, they're preaching the motive, preaching the gospel with the wrong motive, and their wrong motives are making his life rougher and more difficult in jail. And he didn't throw up his hands going, whoa, 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 this is not fair to me. What did he say? It's okay for this to be bad and more difficult for me if the gospel of Jesus is made bigger and better. And I wonder if our mirror, we just put that big X there every morning and look at it, and in little words write, Jesus needs to become bigger and better in my life. That would bring us more joy. But he did more, Paul, when he was writing this. He did more than just saying, take these things out of your life. He did actually say, there's some things you need to add to your life also. In verse Philippi, or chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, he says this. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And so he puts th two things there you can write in your notes. We need to change our mindset to be, who am I considering over myself? Who am I considering over myself? That's a mindset we have. It doesn't come natural. We are born sinful, selfish people. When you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, it is natural to think only about the person that you see in the mirror. But when Christ came, he came to become on the throne of our lives and take us off the throne of our lives. And at that moment, he says, life is not just about you. 
And so our mindset, we need to begin considering other people above ourselves. I wonder on that same getting ready in the mornings, if you have a little marker there, your, your erasable marker, you got your big X there, you're reminding yourself it's more about Jesus than you, and you begin writing names of people on your mirror that you need to put above yourself. You need to put your family members above ourselves. We need to put our coworkers above ourselves. We need to put the person that we're driving to work and we're in a rush, but they seem more rushed than we are, and they cut us off real quick, and every angry thought goes to your mind. What is it about us that says, I need to be in front of this person when it doesn't even really matter? Are you with me? Do you realize how selfish, how self-centered we can be? And it's a mindset that we have to begin to change our mindset or we will never become other-centered as Jesus wants us to be. Because that takes us to the second thing that he says we have to add to our lives. And it's this, you can write this down. Who am I prioritizing over myself? Now watch this on your outline. It's not just mindset now, it is a lifestyle. You see, there is this transition that has to take place as we're becoming more Christ-centered and other centers and take the focus of ourselves. It can't just be a mindset, there also must be a lifestyle behind it. We, may st- we must take conscious physical steps in making people more important than ourselves. You ever been in the car with someone going, where do you want to eat tonight? And you just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I, I think the best thing we-, thing we can do is next time it gets, that ping pong ball gets thrown back to you going, where do you want to eat? I don't care, where do you want to eat? You can just look at that person, whether it's your spouse, whether it's a friend, whether it's whoever it is, and just going, you know what? You are so important. I want to eat where you want to eat. I wonder what that would do to the conversation. That person would probably look at you going, I know I'm important, now what do you want to eat? Okay, because it goes back and forth, back and forth. But it's such a, just a minimal conversation. It doesn't mean much where you're going back and forth, back and forth on where you want to eat. But I wonder how many other things are in life that we're not willing to shoot the ping pong, hit the ping pong ball back in their court or lob the, the tennis ball back in their court. We're just going, you know what? I, I, I need it about me. So what if you woke up tomorrow morning and you said, I am going to prioritize other people over myself? What if you thought before you ever got out of bed as you'd looked in that mirror even going, what are some physical things I can do today to prioritize other people over myself? As we took communion today, I think about that very night that Jesus was with his disciples and he'd had the best example in the world. As they walked in, the Bible says that he bent down to wash their feet. And Jesus, as a teacher, was never supposed to wash anybody else's feet. That was meant for the servants. That was one of the lowliest jobs of all jobs. But yet Jesus said, I need to not just tell you to serve others. I need to serve you. What if our life was characterized characterized more by being a servant than being served to? What would that be like for us? Here's what I know what would take place. I'm not sure what your day would look like, but I know what our hearts would look like. Our hearts would be full of joy because we would be living in the lifestyle. We would be living like Jesus lived. And if we can line our lives up and model Jesus, not just in our minds, but in our actions, it will give us joy in our lives. But here's the problem. Remember, this is a letter. And so Paul's writing this to the Philippians, and he's writing it to us today. And we're hearing this, and it's going in our mind, and it's making sense, and it's making sense. But there's a part of us that's going, but hold on a second. It doesn't make sense. Jesus, it makes sense in your world, but Jesus, in the world that I live in, it doesn't make sense. (laughs) Because if I begin to prioritize everybody, if I begin to put others first, I will be stepped on in everything in life. Because our society, that's not how they do things. And so sometimes I think we read the letter of Paul that he wrote to the Philippians, and our excuse is, well, Jesus, you wrote that, or Paul, you wrote that 2,000 years ago. That might have been easier back in those days, but in today's world, in 2023, you just can't live that life that way. We need to understand this. Life was no different back then. Back in those days, life was focused and centered on power and prestige and position. I'm sorry, in case you got confused, I'm talking about 2,000 years ago, not today. Are you with me how we're we're living the same life? Wouldn't you say a great characteristics of our life or common characteristics is power and prestige and position? And so this whole idea of humility, putting others first, doesn't really fit. It doesn't go with how people live their lives today. 
And so as the Philippians are writing this, I, I think Paul knew what they were thinking before they ever read his letter. And he's going, okay, let me pause here for a second. I told you what you need to do, what you need to put in your life and what you need to take out of your life. But let me pause here for a second and let me tell you the why behind it. And this is what he says in verse 1. Back up a couple of verses. In fact, this time I want to read it from a translation called the Passion Translation and listen to the emotion behind what he's saying. Paul says, look how much encouragement you found in your relationship with the anointed one. You are filled to overflowing with his comforting love. You have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit and you have felt his tender affection and mercy. Here's what Paul was doing. He's going, we need to take this from an intellectual conversation and we need to move it to an intimacy conversation. Look at those words or those expressions he used. You found Jesus' encouragement. You filled with comforting love. You experienced the Holy Spirit's friendship. You felt Jesus' affection and mercy. Here's what Paul was doing. He's going, guys, let me convince you the why. The why is not something you figure out in your mind. The why is something that happens in your heart. Because of what Jesus has done for you, because the way Jesus modeled his life, the reason Jesus gave himself up as a sacrifice, that's why we do it. And here's what I learned this past week. Denise and I had our very first grandma and grandpa week with our granddaughter. First time ever that she came to our house and she stayed there. I just want you to know I loved it when she came and I loved it when she left. I was exhausted, but thank you, Jesus, a Saturday came. And it's Friday morning. I was kind of hitting that point going, okay, it's time to go back to mom and dad's house, right? And I'm up in my loft and I'm doing some studying for the sermon up here. And all of a sudden I hear these words from my little granddaughter. Go, go. That's, she can't say my grandpa name yet. So it's go, 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 go. Where are you? Go, go. Where are you? Go, go. Where are you? I want you to know this mindset of trying to be a good granddad went from my head to my heart at that moment that here was my little granddaughter looking for me all over the house go go where are you go go where are you and I ran down the stairs and I said I'm right here do you want to go to the toy store do you want something to eat what do you want to do I'll do whatever you want to do it's because the affection between my two-year-old granddaughter and the affection of my heart as a grandfather just bonded together right there now watch this church I believe with all my heart The reason there's so many what I'm going to call crabby Christians. Now, I'm not judging you. If that fits, you wear it, okay? But there's so many crabby Christians out there is that we have so much of our relationship Jesus kept up in the intellect of our head and we don't allow it down to the emotions of our heart. I remember when Denise and I first started dating, she lived about 45 minutes from me in a different town. And one night we weren't supposed to go out, but she was sick. And I'm going... My, my, my girlfriend, my fiance, she's sick in another town. Not that I loved her enough yet to go be with her and get sick, but I thought I can't just let her be sick. And so I drove the 45 minutes and dropped a care package of medicine on her doorstep and knocked and went back into my car and said, I just left you something on your doorstep. It wasn't intellect that made me do that. It was the affection and the emotion of my heart. And the reason I think that so many of us walk around and we can't find the joy in our attitude towards things and people and all the stuff around us is because we've not taken the time to say, Jesus, just fill my heart, fill my emotions with all that you've done for me. Because at some point you look and you stand in the presence of Jesus and you say, how can I be self-centered when he did this for me? But if it stays up here, we simply reason it yes and no, good and bad, and it never flows out of our life. Now, here's the deal. A relationship with Jesus is more than emotion, but a relationship with Jesus is more than intellect. It's the two come together. That's the reason Apostle Paul wrote me in the book of Ephesians, I pray that you know God beyond knowledge. Because knowledge doesn't take a relationship down the road. It is the knowledge and the intimacy. It is the intellect and the intimacy that takes us down the road in a real relationship. Now, I would never, ever want to begin to judge and and, and try to classify somebody's salvation. But if you're here today and you're going, Keith, I have no joy. I've not had joy for a long time. I come to church and I go and I feel like I leave as the same person I come in as. And my question is this, do you have an intellectual relationship or do you have a full relationship with Jesus? Do you have the intellect and the emotion and the heart that goes with it? 
because those two combined is what truly changes us. And that's what Paul, the apostle Paul was trying to say. He's going, how can we, why do we want to make others first? Why do we want to make these adjustments in our life so we have a better attitude? It's because when we stand in the presence of a holy Jesus, we have no choice but to respond that way. He says, look how much encouragement you found in your relationship with the anointed one. You are filled to overflowing with this comforting love. You have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit and have left his tender mercy and have felt his tender affection and his mercy. And when you step into that, you have no choice to say, my life will be adjusted because of that. Now, the next thing that Paul does in his letter, I think is like, sometimes you look going, what an amazing writer. Like he, he's thinking out, writing out, and just got this big plan what he's writing. So he has some more verses, but here's what the next verses that we're about to read, here's what he does. They aren't his own words. Paul reaches in that most theologians believe, reached in, and this is a very popular song or hymn that was sung back then. And I thought, I think it's masterful that he did this, and here's why. Don't you know how songs, certain songs can bring forth a response by your part? I mean, I mean, for me, I grew up in the 80s. Let a Cindy Lauper song came on, and I just, I'm feeling it, right? Okay, it takes me all the way back to high school in there. Or put one of the Chicago love songs, and it reminds me of those high school dances. There's something, there's certain songs in her life that takes you back to a place and brings forth a response on your part. And so I think at this point, when Paul is writing his letter to the Philippians, he's going, I, I need to really like get them to get this. So instead of writing his own words to convince them and further the, the argument, he says, let me write the words of the song. Now, I'm having to suppose, but, but just as I look at this, here's what I'm thinking. As the Philippians are reading this next part, and they're reading the words to a very popular song they knew, all of a sudden their head and their heart begin to match. That these words that he wrote brought them emotionally and mentally on the same page with what Paul was trying to convince them. Let, let me read these words to you. Philippians chapter, five, verse five, chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. And remember, they're words to us, very popular common words in a popular scripture these days. But when the Philippians wrote them, they're like, wow, that was my song from two years ago. That's that song that we sing every week at the end of our celebration, our church services together. It brought back this response. And he says in verse 5, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used on his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and he gave him the name that is above every name, and that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And as he's writing those words to them, here's what I think is taking place with, with the Philippians. Their bad attitude, they became convicted about their bad attitude. Because they could still kind of hold out, well, well, you don't know how the people around me or you know how they act, and you don't know what I'm dealing with over here. And so they're still trying to justify their bad attitude on as so far as adding things and detracting things. And all of a sudden, Paul goes, hey, you still don't get it? Let me give you an example. The example is Jesus. He humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. And he begins listing out the lyrics of that song. And all of a sudden, the, the, I believe the Philippians, their, their conviction of their bad attitude and they became aware of all that Jesus had done for them. And all of a sudden at that moment as well, not only were they convicted and aware of what Jesus had done for them, they became motivated to make some changes. They knew the change they needed to make was to take away a few things and add a few things. And the reason they did it is because Jesus had done it for them. I'm gonna ask the band to come back up. We're gonna close today with our song. We thought about putting this song, th these lyrics to, to words, and they're like, well, we wouldn't really understand that. There's a song that we've been singing all summer long so far, and it's Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. And the song is whatever. I, I trust that you guys have been memorizing um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, but we've taken this song and it helps put it to us. And here's my prayer as we close our service with this song, that the emotions of the song the intellect of the scripture will come together, which will inspire us and challenge us to be people of humility.
to, to be people that will live our lives tomorrow with a big X on our mirror in our bathroom. <laughs> that will be people tomorrow that looks around us and says, these folks that I see are more important than the person that I see in the mirror. And I do it because that's the way Jesus lived his life for me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you um, that you that you inspire us, that you challenge us, that you convict us. Thank you that you modeled for us, Jesus, how to live in humility. And God, it doesn't make sense in our world that we live in, but I pray that as we live a life of humility, that we will find our joy and our attitude. May our life be about others just as your life was about us. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Would you please rise and join us? Things are true. Whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, I will dwell on these. Whatever things are pure. Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, I will dwell on thee. You remind me of your goodness, you are the God. my eyes and I set my gaze on the good you've given me whatever things are good I will dwell on these Smile.
things are right. Whatever things are wholesome, whatever brings your peace, I'll dwell on these. Thank you for joining us in worship.